I want to thank you for joining us in our next study in the book of Isaiah. I'll ask if you will at this time to please be turning to Isaiah chapter 13. And we will be continuing the, uh, this, the context that we've been looking at regarding the destruction of Babylon. We're going to basically there in chapter 13 verses 17 through the end of the chapter, we're going to look at the destruction of Babylon. Then in chapter 14 verses 1 and 2, we'll see a message to God's people. And then we'll pick back up in verse 3 of chapter 14 and look at a taunt or a proverb, uh, as some better translated, against Babylon. And then we'll be moving on into um, Assyria as well there in chapter 14. So that's what we'll be looking at um, in the coming discussion. In our last discussion, we looked at chapter 13, verses 6 through 16, as it related to the day of the Lord. And remember that we indicated that that's not talking about a specific day, but it's speaking more of the reality of what is going to happen. And it's the reality of these nations, these enemies of, Egypt, uh, these enemies of Israel that are going to go down uh, as it relates to God punishing them as well. And we'll be able to trace through all of these uh, as we look at these references made uh, through chapter 23, as we look at these prophecies against the nations. So let's pick back up there, chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. And let's read that again to set the stage for this. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them who will not regard silver, and as for gold, they will not delight in it. Also their bows will dash the young men to pieces, and they will have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eye will not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. The hyenas will howl in their citadels and jackals in their pleasant places. Her time is near to come, and her days will not be prolonged. So again, we're looking at very pointed language as it relates to what's going to happen to Babylon. Remember the pride that Babylon had, the, the arrogance, the overconfidence. Uh, all of those were seen because of what they saw as military power. Remember, we've talked about the walls around the city and how, for, how well fortified the city of Nineveh was. And the point is that none of this is going to be any avail no matter how successful they had been in the past. And they were successful when they took Assyria down as the power. The Medes helped them to do so. We'll look at this again here in just a few moments. But man is not going to stop what God had promised to do, what God had set his mind to do here. And so we have a great lesson as it relates to military might or financial might or anything else does not place somebody in a situation where they're guaranteed to maintain that sense of superiority to others. How often we see those with that military might or that financial might or education, regardless of what area that we look at being depicted. We see often people look down their nose at others in a, as a superior to an inferior. Well, we're going to see the tables reversed. We're going to see the tables turned on these people as we move through this material. There in verse 17, the Medes were allies, remember, with Babylon when they went against Assyria. Uh, they defeated Assyria in 612 B.C. Later, Cyrus, the Medo-Persian king, subdued them, and in 539 B.C., the forces of Media and Persia then overcame Babylon. That's what this is talking about. God was using the nation or the combined nation of the Medo-Persians to punish Babylon for how they treated others round about them. And so as this unfolds historically, 
we see that being the case. Now, something that we want to remember here as well is chapter 13 through 23 is not necessarily chronological. As a matter of fact, there's places when it's not. Here we see the destruction of Babylon being promised, being prophesied. But as we get down to the end of chapter 14, we're going to see that Assyria is going to go down. Well, Assyria went down before Babylon. So chronology, historical details, is not exactly what's being depicted here. Isaiah, rather, is depicting the power of God as it relates to his people and as it relates to the nations that are round about them. As we look at these nations fall, as we look at God's will uh, being fulfilled in all of these areas. In verse 18, Isaiah indicated by prophecy that the Medes would have no mercy on the Babylonians, would have no pity. That's the word that is used in the context. Now, now that word pity speaks of a deep love. And it's usually a deep love that is manifested by a superior to an inferior. In other words, we have pity on somebody else. The idea seems to be that we're stronger, that we're more powerful, that we're at a higher echelon. But it's still a deep love. There's still a connection, some kind of relationship between the two that makes pity being a response to the situation of somebody else. And often it's the, uh, you, you look at battle. I want you to imagine a warrior, mighty warrior, powerful, all the armor, all the armament and, that he has, and he's up against a force that is much weaker than he. He has the capability to bring somebody down, but rather than doing that, he withholds and he takes pity on the individual. Now, having said those things, notice how that's negated as it relates to the Medo-Persian approach to Babylon. They're not going to have pity. They're not going to withhold. It's going to be horrible as it relates to what happened to Babylon. Well, in their cruelty, Israel's and Babylon's enemies would have no pity. They would have no compassion on them. Then in verses 19 to 22, Babylon is said, it's said of Babylon that they would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, we said last time that it's interesting how often a picture is drawn, an illustration is made about the flood regarding God's wiping out of evil men and, and the few that were saved there, the total destruction that came on the earth. And as a matter of fact, we're still dealing with things today that are a consequence of the flood and what happened. Sin brought the flood. We see a lot of changes in climate. We see a lot of... Uh, evil in the world. We see sickness. We see sin in the world. We look at catastrophic events like tornadoes and, uh, and hurricanes and things such as that. We didn't see those things before the flood. The world was vastly changed. And a consequence of the evil of the world were the difficulties that we face. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah is another one of those situations where you see total destruction that was occurring. When we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, we, we, we have to think about Lot and his family. Angelic visitors came and approached. And, and when the men of the city knew that they were there, they came to them and, 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 and they demanded that Lot release them so that they could have sexual relations with the visitors. It was so widespread. Remember that the text indicates that it was every man that was involved. I've heard a lot of people today talking about uh, our situation today being worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not the case. We still have light in this world. We still have a few. Uh, as Elijah was told, there's still 400 prophets that have not bowed the knee to Baal. We look at times being evil today, yes. But is it worse than Sodom and Gomorrah? I don't, I don't think so. I'm not saying it's not in our capability to get to that point as society has manifested. But at this point, Babylon has shown that they were going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were totally wiped out, but they were wiped out for one reason, because of the widespread sin. Remember as Abraham was, was, was involved in that situation, Abraham, to a degree, began to bargain with God. Well, what if I found 50 people there? Or what if I found 45 people there? Or 40 people there? 
And you go on down that list, the bottom number that Abraham got to, that number wasn't even found. And so we see how dark uh, the comment was made or the situation was, was realized about how vile that Sodom and Gomorrah was. Well, Babylon's compared to them. They're going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah is what has been stated. After God destroyed them, they became illustrations for wickedness and total destruction as Sodom and Gomorrah have. When Sodom and Gomorrah are mentioned today, widespread evil is remembered. It's thought about. It's, it, 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 it's related to the name. Total destruction is also related to the name because of the widespread evil and the sin. And what Isaiah is indicating here is that later on in future years of history, when the name Babylon is mentioned, it's going to carry with it the idea of evil and it's going to carry with it the idea of their being completely brought down by God for their sin. Placing that illustration before them, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, even the place that it was sitting supposedly is no longer even there. I believe that the, the, the Dead Sea uh, has even encompassed some of it. So, some of what was going on there was is, is under what is now the boundary of the Red, of, of the Dead Sea. Babylon is told that it's going to be a place that's not going to be inhabited. I haven't looked at a map to see what's over there today, but it's very sparsely populated. But at the time it's being spoken of here, it's going to be a wasteland when God gets through. People aren't going, to, aren't going to live there. Shepherds aren't going to take care of their sheep there. The same way with those raising goats. None of that's going to happen. It's going to be a place for jackals and porcupines. It's going to be a place for wild animals only. And that speaks, at least in a, in a figurative sense, we can see that it describes complete and total destruction is what's promised. Well, then we move into just a very brief, what, what seems to be a parenthetical situation here regarding God's compassion on his people. And this is found in chapter 14 and verses 1 and 2. Let's continue as we read. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. Then people will take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. They will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. Okay. Placing these words of assurance before God's people shows the close connection with the punishment of the wicked and the redemption of of the faithful remnant. Even in this time of horrible situations, we're going to see a bright spot for God's people. Now, there's some concern, there's some question as to exactly when this was fulfilled. And at the very least, maybe we can see a partial fulfillment in the remnant, but the primary fulfillment is going to occur in a messianic hope. And that's what I want us to focus on for, for just a little bit here. So in light of what he said, verses chapter 13, verses 17 to 22, the end of chapter 13, a, a bleak picture has been painted for Babylon. They're going to go down. They're going to fall. They're going to be destroyed. There's no hope provided. Nobody's going to have pity. Nobody's going to have compassion on them. Yet in spite of that dark time, now God steps in and he speaks to his people and manifest his compassion. When you look there at verse 1, there's, there's three words or, or, or words and phrases that provide assurance for God's people. Now, let's step back just a little bit. Where are God's people in relation to what's being said about Babylon? When Babylon became the world power, remember that the ten northern tribes have been carried up into Assyria, and when Babylon overcame Assyria, those tribes were, were brought into the realm 
of Babylon, as were those in Judah that were brought in. And so we, we see that being a dark time for God's people here. But through all of that, through these captivities, the promise of a remnant has been seen uh, as a comforting message. God still has work to do. We talked a little bit about this in our last lesson. We see the phrase mercy. We see the fact that God is going to choose Israel. And we see the fact that he's going to settle Israel. So the concept of mercy, choose, and settle are three words describing the comfort and the assurance that should be there for God's people. Mercy suggests the feeling that people should have for each other as human beings. We should be merciful in our dealings with others. God clearly has been merciful regarding mankind throughout. God had mercy on us in providing his son that we could have the opportunity for eternal life. We didn't deserve it. None of those who received God's favor throughout the Old Testament deserved that favor. Sin brought death. Sin brings separation between man and God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they deserved to be killed immediately. But God had mercy on them. Well, when you look and see the mercy that's going to be extended here to God's people, it's going to be initially seen in the remnant being brought back into the land. But there's a much more powerful concept that's being described here as it relates to the future. Israel was chosen by God to be their special people. Remember, from from. Adam and Eve on, as it related to once sin entered into the world, right on up to the base of Mount Sinai, everybody at that point was living under patriarchal law. But then God pulled off the Jews, Israel, to some extent, and he gave them the law of Moses. And then the, the lion's share of the remainder of the Old Testament was focused in on God's people there. Yes, God was still concerned about the Gentiles, and patriarchal law continued right up to the cross as well. But as it relates to God's purposes to get us to Christ, as remembered in our Scheme of Redemption studies, Genesis 3.15 is the first of the Messianic references, and Genesis 3.16 onward is designed to tell us who that seed was that's even refined under Abraham. But here's the point. The seed promise has not yet come. There are still things that are going to be accomplished. There's a line to be maintained and to, and, and to be kept pure. And that is all seen regarding God's people. Remember that Christ was going to come through Judah. 2 Samuel chapter 7, David is given assurance that the line is going to be kept pure till we get to the Messiah. That's why I believe this is an ultimately it's talking about the Messiah and what happens as it relates to us, as it related to the early church and, and how we might be an extension of that very thing today. That God chose them also is an indication that God could have rejected them. God would have been within his rights to reject both Israel and Judah because of their idolatry. But that wasn't the case. There's a remnant that was cared for, that was protected. And then that word settle carries the idea of causing somebody to rest or providing them a rest. Let's continue this thought. Now, as I said earlier, this is not a reference per se to the remnant, because the things being said that did not occur in the time of the remnant. Did the remnant begin the concept? I believe that's a better case. But let's also think about this for just a moment. When we look at, at, at the 12 minor prophets, those prophets are broken up into uh, pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic prophets. In other words, there were some who prophesied before exile. There were those like Daniel and Ezekiel 
who were prophesying during captivity. And then the final three were what we call post-exilic prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They were prophesying after the people got back. When the people got back, when the remnant got into the land and got settled into the land, there was a whole new point of focus. Idolatry was no longer that which was really addressed because that was no longer really a problem as it relates to why they were carried off into captivity. They were carried off into captivity because of idolatry, and they learned their lesson very well. No, when the post-exilic prophets came back, the key point from that point forward was Messiah is coming. And I think that's key to what we're looking at. We can't think of the remnant without thinking of Messiah because that was a renewal of the prophecy given to Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Remember the two other prophecies to Abraham have already been fulfilled. The promises to Abraham, the land promise and the, and the uh, great nation promise. But there's still one to go. And that king that is coming still must come through the line of Judah. So as the people are brought back into the land, they've been shown mercy, they've been reminded that they're chosen by God and they're settled back at home. We're going to see a shift looking ahead now to Messiah. And I believe that's the key thought that we're looking at here. Homer Haley, in his commentary on Isaiah, said this, The returned Jews never actually enslaved Gentiles. Remember, that was a part of what we're told there in those two verses. This was a prophecy that was largely messianic, as I continue, and was fulfilled as they quote-unquote conquered foreigners by the Spirit of God through truth. In other words, the ultimate fulfillment of these thoughts in, in, in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, were messianic in their nature. And they were, they, were, they were filled primarily, fulfilled primarily, through the living and the preaching and the teaching of truth. People's minds were brought captive. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, bears that out. Now let's move on, chapter 14, verses 3 through 23. Uh, after an introductory thought regarding Judah, the remainder of this section is what's called a poetic taunt, as some people translate it. Other people translate it as a proverb, and that may be the better term there. Toward the end of the 8th century B.C., the Babylonians were starting to assert their dominance. And... Uh, more than 100 years would pass before they captured Jerusalem and took the people into captivity. I know that I've been repetitive here, but I believe I, I needed to go back to, to, to get some of this, to bring this forward, to, to keep it in its context. We're, we're talking about verses, uh, primarily their verses uh, 3 through 19 speak very to a, to a very great detail. Uh, uh, about these oppressors and the cruelty of Assyria and Babylon and the promise of rest that God had given uh, the oppressors because the oppressors. And, 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 and this was going to cause God's people to shout with joy when they saw all of these people go down. Arrogance was going to be a key thought there uh, as it related to Babylon going down. And remember I said there's a reversal of fortune here. The tables are turning. This arrogance that is being seen, the power that is being manifested by Babylon is going to be taken away. Babylon's going to be humbled and they're going to be completely destroyed. They're going to fall as a nation and they're going to be overpowered by the Medo-Persians. So now let's look at the oracle against Assyria in verses 24 through 27 of chapter 14. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and in, on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulders. 
This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? In the closing verses of this chapter, we're going to see oracles being given against Assyria and against Philistia. Some say that the abrupt shift from Babylon to Assyria indicates that the oracle was given at a later time. Remember I said at the very outset of this, I don't think we need to get caught up in seeing all of these things chronologically because it didn't happen that way. If Assyria is going down here, then the, the chapter before would be out of chronological order. But he's dealing with concepts. He's dealing with the, the enemies of themselves and what's going to happen as a reality and not necessarily being written as a historical textbook that's going to provide chronological order for us. The words sworn, sworn, as I have thought and purposed, all these in, indicate the purpose of God. In other words, God has purposed. He set out to do something, and nothing is going to stop him. That's what's being addressed uh, as we move into this section. God's purposes are going to be accomplished just as he said they would be. Now, when you look at Assyria, again, we think about arrogance. We think about pride. God here announced his intention to break Assyria and to tread Assyria underfoot. Isaiah lived to see that prophecy fulfilled, and it was likely fulfilled in the destruction of Sennacherib when Hezekiah was king. Remember there, 2 Kings chapter 19 bears that out. Also, we'll see more about it in Isaiah chapter 37 as we look ahead. Sennacherib was defeated, and in his own mind, he was overconfident. Sennacherib's prism, a clay cylinder, which, was, it, it, which is in the library in London, the museum in London. There's an inscription there that said, I, Sennacherib, had him, Hezekiah, shut up as a bird in a cage. He thought it was all over but the shouting, as my dad would say. But we know in the context of 2 Kings chapter 19, the promise is made that he would not enter the land. His bows would have no impact. And what we do know is that God, through his chosen means, destroyed 185,000 Assyrians in a given night. Powerful fulfillment of that. Now that action is going to remove a yoke or a burden from God's people. Assyria, at, that, at least in that situation, is not going to be a problem anymore. Now, they would be later. 722 B.C., the ten northern tribes are carried off into captivity. But they would not be a burden on Judah anymore, as Hezekiah was the king of Judah. Well, Israel is the model of the universal, which is about to come, all of the enemies are going to go down. And, and, and the powerful point is that when God announces his plan, that there's nothing man is going to be able to do to stop it. Oh, I think about how blessed we are regarding Christ. If the Jews had had their way, that would not have been the case. Numerous times through history, men have tried to stomp out God's plan. When you look at Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, Satan's thought was, if he can commit one sin, then he'll no longer be that perfect sacrifice. We don't see that anywhere, but I believe that's implied in what Satan was trying. He was trying to bring him down. He was trying to tempt him to do something that he shouldn't have done that he couldn't do. Well, we're about out of time. We're going to start here next week. And we're going to start looking at the oracle against Felicia. I'm not going to be doing any more um, background work. We're pretty much set there. We're now going to step out. Appreciate your patience.
uh, in my working back through some of those things that I really didn't get to emphasize, that I wanted to emphasize even more as I thought about it this week. But we'll pick up with Philistia, Lord willing, next week. Uh, and then we'll look at Moab as well there in chapters 15 and 16. And that'll take up several of our lessons. Thank you for joining us again in our study of the book of Isaiah. Again, I, I hope and pray uh, that, that, that you're feeding on God's word here provided through Isaiah and that we can get the same comfort, we can get the same assurance as his readers. But at the same time, maybe we can pay attention to some of the same threats and promises regarding evil. Until next time, God bless you.